My name is Ashlyn McGee. I'm the new Vice President of the Melbourne Press Club and a reporter at the 7.30 program on the ABC. And I'm delighted to welcome you all today to lunch with Professor Ross Garno, who is one of this country's pre-eminent public thinkers, and it's uh, fantastic to have him here. Ross Garno has just released his new book, Superpower, uh, which you'd have to say is an ambitious roadmap to reform Australia from the coal-loving country that we are at the very frontier of climate change to an economic superpower in the post-carbon world. It is an ambitious plan and an, and an ambitious roadmap. I will formally introduce Professor Garno a little later after we've had lunch, but I first wanted to thank some of our fabulous sponsors. Uh, without them, events like this for the Press Club simply would not be possible, so we really appreciate their support. If I can thank Monash University and Professor Johan Lidberg is here, Virgin Australia, Minta Ellison and Sam White is here from Minta Ellison, Commonwealth Bank, Crown Resort, Sonia Bauer is here representing Crown, our major media sponsors are The Herald Sun, The Age, Leader Newspapers, Channel 7, Channel 9, Channel 10, The ABC, 3AW, AAP and Sky News. Our major sponsors are Telstra, McPherson Kelly Lawyers, Australia Post, RACV and the AFL. And we have a very special guest with us today, the Right Honourable Mayor, Honourable rather, Mayor of Melbourne, Sally Capps. So a special welcome to you. And as I say, a big thank you to our sponsors because without them, lunches like this would not be possible. We will have lunch served very shortly and we'll be back to hear from Ross Garno just after lunch. So please grab a drink uh, and settle in for a little bit. Well, it certainly has been an exceptional week and continues to be an exceptional week uh, in New South Wales and in Queensland with the bushfires up there. And certainly climate change is probably not exactly what's on people's minds as they are battling to save their homes, their lives, their friends, their neighbours, their properties. Uh, here in Victoria, we're bracing for extreme weather this summer, for power outages, for devastating bushfires, um, and we're already in planning for that. And in Canberra, we've certainly seen some pretty extraordinary scenes in the past couple of days. I think David Crow from... Fairfax summed it up best today when he said, the higher the flames, the lower the politics. And certainly our politicians have shown that climate change continues to be their preferred battleground. So it's in that context that Ross Garno is releasing his latest book, Superpower, uh, and we are delighted to have him here today to do that. Superpower, as I said before, is an ambitious roadmap uh, to not just cope with climate change, but for Australia to prosper and indeed to become an economic superpower in this post-carbon world that we are heading towards. Professor Garno is no stranger to controversy, to political firestorms. Uh, he's weathered many of them uh, in his public life. And he is, as I say, one of the country's preeminent public thinkers in this space. He's a professorial, professorial rather, research fellow at the University of Melbourne. Uh, he's authored the eponymous Climate Change Review about a decade ago, who was an advisor to Bob Hawke. He's been an ambassador to China and he's a keen observer of China and the Pacific. And it's this broad experience that he's brought to this book, Superpower, that shaped these big ideas. Uh, and it's very rich with detail as well about how Australia can indeed uh, map its way to becoming this superpower. So I'm very delighted to welcome Professor Ross Garno to deliver an address. Uh, thanks, Ash, and uh, uh, good to have with us uh, the, the Lord Mayor, Sally Cap, uh, uh, and uh, the publisher of Black Ink, uh, Maury Schwartz. Uh, this is the second of my books that uh, Black Ink has published and it's been a great experience on both occasions. And uh, uh, pres presuming I stay in my saddle uh, might be more, Murray, yeah. But, but anyway, th thanks for what we've already done. Uh, and uh, gra great to be here. Uh, the, the book... Um, uh, in one sense, uh, is 
uh, a review of what's happened uh, in relation to climate change and the energy transition since I did my two official reviews, uh, the uh, Climate Change Review of 2008, which was originally commissioned by all of the state governments and territory governments of Australia with an invitation for the Commonwealth to join. And the Commonwealth joined when Kevin Rudd became Prime Minister late in 2007. It then became a federal state uh, uh, exercise. Uh, but, but when it was a state exercise, uh, the Secretariat was in the Premier's department in Treasury Place, uh, and uh, Melbourne was the, the, the home of the effort when it became a joint federal state uh, exercise. We had a Secretariat in Canberra as well. And uh, uh, the, the really big uh, detailed analysis of the effects of climate change on Australia, what would happen if we didn't do anything about it, if the world didn't get on top of this uh, serious problem, uh, and uh, the costs of doing something about it, the cost of Australia playing its full part in an effective global effort to uh, contain climate change, uh, that, that was all in the first big volume, the very detailed modelling. Um, uh, at the time, uh, that exercise had the support of every government in Australia, federal and state, and a lot of uh, support from municipal governments. I, the draft report uh, uh, were, were, was discussed to full houses in Melbourne Town Hall and Brisbane Town Hall, Sydney Town Hall, Adelaide uh, Town Hall, Perth uh, Town Hall, and Town Halls in a lot of our big provincial uh, uh, cities. Um, but it also had the support of the federal opposition. Um, Malcolm Turnbull was then leader of the opposition and he followed very closely what I was doing. I reported regularly to him and to uh, members of his front bench. Um, had a number of important discussions. And so uh, at that time we, we thought that uh, we were on a path to uh, uh, a set of policies that would allow Australia to play its full part in an effective global uh, effort. Uh, that was all disrupted uh, a year after my review, uh, after legislation embodying my main recommendations had been passed by the House of Representatives and uh, was due to go to the Senate and Turnbull had committed the, the Liberal Party to support of, of the legislation in the Senate, but the day before the Senate vote uh, he lost his job by a single vote uh, and the rest is history. Uh, well, there was a bit of a uh, hiatus, but... Uh, uh, there was then a surprising development. There's nothing in this story that's not surprising, the story of climate change policy in Australia. We ended up with a hung parliament, and uh, uh, the two independent rural members who were going to decide who was going to be Prime Minister of Australia, uh, Oakshot and Windsor, both uh, rural members from, uh, uh, from the northern half of New South Wales, uh, spent a fair bit of time with me after the election talking, they were both very serious about climate change and talking about the conditions they should place on, uh, uh, on uh, any agreement on entering government. And uh, when they reached their agreement with Julia Gillard, part of the agreement was that I'd be asked to update my review and that uh, uh, there'd be a uh, multi-party uh, uh, committee on climate change that they'd be members of to to which, with which um, I would work in doing my update. So that's, that's the origin of my second review for the multi-party parliamentary committee on climate change. Um, that, uh, because that committee included the independents uh, and the Greens as well as the, 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 the Prime Minister, the Treasurer and the Minister for Climate Change, uh, Greg Combe, uh, it, it had the numbers for, to get legislation through the reps and the Senate. Uh, and so the recommendations from that second review uh, sailed through and became law. And for two years, we had a pretty good climate policy. Uh, we established the Australian Renewable Energy Agency, the Clean Energy Finance Corporation, the Climate Change Authority, the Carbon Farming Initiative. Uh, and that was all bound together with a a carbon pricing arrangement. We already had the renewable energy target that uh, Kevin Rudd had legislated. Uh, he had got that through while he was still Prime Minister. Uh, but uh, uh, Tony Abbott had rolled 
uh, Malcolm Turnbull on the climate issue, and uh, uh, he was uh, he made uh, getting rid of the whole raft of climate-related legislation uh, a part of his platform in 2013 when he won office. Uh, but uh, uh, his getting a big majority in the House of Representatives did not give him the Senate. Uh, the, the, the Senate majority uh, was going to depend on uh, the votes of Clive Palmer, Clive Palmer who just uh, invested $20 uh, million from uh, uh, a, 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 uh, an insolvent uh, Queensland company in buying uh, four Senate seats. Uh, uh, and, but he needed every one of those four, Tony Abbott needed every one of those four for uh, the legislation to pass. Uh, and then uh, he didn't have it because he didn't have, he was one short. Uh, uh, but um, uh, the, in an extraordinary, another extraordinary uh, event, uh, uh, there had to be a Senate uh, re uh, re rerun of the, uh, uh, for Western Australia uh, a few months after the election. and so. Uh, whether there were the votes in the Senate to get rid of all of the carbon legislation depended on the results of that Senate election. So I put quite a bit of effort into that. I debated Clive Palmer on late line the Thursday before the Senate uh, rerun. My friend said I could have done a better job, so m maybe, uh, maybe it's all my fault. But uh, anyway, Clay Clive uh, was a thorough denialist. He was going to support the repeal of everything. But that wasn't the end of the twists. Uh, uh, six months later, to everyone's amazement, uh, he and Al Gore announced a joint press conference in Parliament House Canberra and together stood up and Clive said, well, I've spent the day with uh, uh, Vice President Gore, respectfully still called him Vice President, uh, and uh, I used to think that climate change science was a lot of rubbish, but now I see it's the most important issue in the world, so I'm, I'm not going to uh, support the repeal of all of this legislation. And so I'm, not, I'm going to block repeal of uh, the Australian Renewable Energy Agency, the Clean Energy Finance Corporation, uh, the uh, Carbon Farming Initiative, uh, the, uh, 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 the Climate Change Authority. And on carbon pricing, uh, I'm going to just change one thing. Uh, I, I'm going to support that repeal, but I'm going to reintroduce legislation in the Senate that's almost identical. Well, of course, that was exactly the same as supporting repeal because he reintroducing a bill had no effect. That last measure saved him personally $80 million. So uh, uh, Clive was, is a man of high principle and not spending $80 million on a carbon tax that you don't have to spend is the highest of principles. Uh, so, so we kept all of the institutions except for carbon pricing. Unfortunately, carbon pricing was the centerpiece of the whole thing. So uh, that was a huge loss. Uh, as you see in the book, uh, in, in the four years where there was confident expectation that carbon pricing was coming, and then the two years in which we had carbon pricing, we had consistent steady rate of uh, emissions, which if we'd continued at that rate, we would have had zero net emissions by the middle of this century. Uh, we were on the path we needed to be on. And we did that without any disruption of industry. There was no wiping of Wyala off the map. There was no closure of aluminium smelters. All of those things have been carefully thought through. It was working exactly as anticipated. Most economic modelling doesn't work that well. We'd done estimates of what the effect on the consumer price index and it came out right to the 0.1%. Uh, Usually when you introduce a big change like this, the Commonwealth Public Service makes it a little bit of an administrative mess and that's all controversial. That happened with the GST and John Howard. It didn't happen with carbon pricing. Everything worked more or less perfectly, but we didn't keep carbon pricing. We kept the other institutions. Keeping the other institutions and keeping, although a compromised form of the renewable energy target meant that uh, uh, we, uh, we, we've made substantial progress on growth of renewable energy uh, over the past half dozen years when we've gone backwards in many other areas. Well, the book is, uh, at one level, a story of what's happened since uh, 2011. It looks at changes in, in the science, changes in our understanding of the ethics of climate change, uh, changes in the international uh, framework for cooperating on climate change mitigation, and changes in economics. Given my background, I hope you'll forgive me
for, for most of the book being about the economics, but uh, uh, I, I treat the other issues seriously. On the science, the summary I come to is that there's been that a lot of good scientific research, a lot of good work in um, atmospheric physics uh, since uh, 2008 and 2011. What's that, what that has done, it hasn't radically changed average expectations, it has reduced uncertainty. That's bad news. Uh, when when uh, the, the mean of expectations is not very different from what it was uh, eight years ago, but there's less uncertainty, which means we can't, the, the, the straws on which some people were, were clinging uh, are uh, less substantial uh, than they were uh, eight years ago. There has been more focus in the last uh, eight years uh, on the substantial risks of things happening that could make outcomes much worse than we expect. And that's why the scientific discussion has led quite strongly to a focus on holding temperature increases to 1.5 degrees uh, rather than two degrees. Uh, very important developments in the discussion of ethics of climate change in the last eight years. Uh, uh, human ethical systems depend on the history of social experience. Uh, as, a, as societies, we've developed ethical systems around social experience. And this issue uh, comes outside our normal experience. The, the, the damage that's done from actions today, uh, a lot of it will, be, will occur in the long term, some of it in the very long term, in other countries, uh, to people we don't know. Uh, we don't know who they'll be. Uh, it raises different sorts of ethical questions, and there's been quite a lot of thinking about the ethics. And I refer to, in particular to two contributions, uh, that of uh, Pope Francis in Laudato Si. Uh, his encyclical, Laudato Si is authoritative on the atmospheric physics. Uh, his lead advisor was um, one of the two or three main authorities on this earth in atmospheric physics, a uh, friend of mine, uh, uh, Joachim uh, Schoenhuber uh, at Potsdam Institute. Uh, the, 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 the physics of climate change in the encyclical is the best of con contemporary science. Uh, and the ethical treatment is careful and logical, uh, it, uh, and it's meant to appeal not just to the one-third of humanity that professes Christian belief, but to the quarter of humanity that professes other uh, belief in the Abrahamic uh, tradition, uh, and to the rest of, uh, of uh, humanity, uh, whether uh, secular or uh, religious. Uh, and that's a very important development. I also refer to the work of John Broom, a professor of ethics at uh, Oxford University, uh, who caught my attention when he, uh, uh, when he drew an analogy between uh, private action that leads to greater greenhouse emissions and to shooting a rifle into a distant crowd. It will damage someone, it will, will kill someone at some margin uh, of activity, but you don't know who it will be, you, you won't see who it is. Is it uh, any less reprehensible to, to shoot uh, a rifle into a distant crowd than to shoot the person sitting next to you at lunch? So I think we would all answer pretty reprehensible to shoot the rifle into a distant crowd. He says, well, that's what we're doing if we uh, uh, if we increase our personal uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And he comes to the strong conclusion that we've all got a personal obligation to offset uh, our own emissions. Um, the big, big developments in the international uh, uh, framework of climate change, and uh, r rather surprisingly, and certainly would have surprised me when I was doing the work in 2008, the developments have moved away from attempts to build a legally binding uh, top-down international agreement into a framework that I call concerted unilateral mitigation, voluntary contributions, peer review, regular meetings of senior representatives of government to upgrade uh, commitments all around the very clear and firm agreement reached in Paris uh, to uh, hold temperature increases below two de degrees Celsius uh, and as close as possible to 1.5 degrees. That's the centre of the the Paris Agreement, everything else is peripheral to that. 
Uh, and uh, the, at the core of the uh, uh, Paris Agreement is a commitment for uh, government leaders periodically every five years to meet, to assess progress, and to adjust ambition upwards uh, so that we get, get to that zero emissions outcome. Uh, and in practice, that's turning out to be a much more promising basis for international cooperation than the old approach that failed at Copenhagen. Then on the economics, uh, here the changes are largest and they've been dramatic and uh, uh, I can't hide from my own uh, misjudgments. Uh, they're all on record, eight, hundreds and hundreds of pages of my modelling that's premised on solar prices falling by a few percent per annum. Now I base that, that, uh, that, that assumption in the modelling on consultations I had with the people who really know about these things, not only in Australia, but in Japan, China, Korea, the US, Germany, and the UK. Uh, well, what's happened has been dramatically uh, more favorable than assumed in, in that modeling. Uh, solar energy costs fell by 85% in, uh, in the decade after my report. Uh, 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 so wind costs have also fallen steadily. Uh, uh, less dramatically, but also very considerably, the cost of battery storage to firm uh, solar uh, and wind uh, has fallen dramatically. Um, so, whereas in 2008, uh, I, I uh, thought that there, w there was a cost for several decades in us making the transition, but that cost was very much justified by avoiding the damage later on for future generations of Australians, the, 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 the destructive damage of climate change. Uh, now, uh, if I redid that modelling with up-to-date parameters, we'd see that there's not, not a cost even in the relatively short term, and there's immense economic gains later on. The other big economic factor is that there's been more focus in the world as a whole on the opportunities for storing carbon uh, in soils, uh, woodlands, uh, uh, pastures, forests, uh, plantations. Uh, th these are potentially very important. And Australia, Australia has more opportunity in this area than any other country on earth. Large areas of land relative to population, and a lot of that area not under intensive agricultural uh, cultivation. Uh, and. Uh, uh, we are also by far the richest country on earth in, in uh, renewable energy resources. Combination of these, these two things is really the basis of the premise of Australia as superpower of the low carbon uh, world economy. Um, uh, just focusing on the, uh, the energy based advantage, uh, uh, we've got the best solar combination of solar and wind resources, the main sources of new renewable energy in the world. Uh, that means that unless we muck it up, and Australians uh, are, are not strangers to mucking things up, but if, unless we muck it up, we're the low cost energy country in the world, in the world of zero emissions, which the world is committed to getting to by the middle of this century. And that means we're the natural home of industries that use a lot of energy. Now it happens that a lot of these in industries are the same industries uh, for which we supply the raw materials. We're by far the world's biggest supplier of iron oxide, iron ore for processing into metals. Uh, we're by far the world's biggest su supplier of aluminium ore for processing into uh, aluminium metal. Uh, we're a natural supplier of the huge quantities of silicon, which pure silicon which is the main input into uh, both photovoltaic uh, panels and computers, uh, the two big growth industries of the, of the modern world. Uh, silicon requires just two things. One, silicon oxide, uh, sand or quartz, and we've got plenty of that, uh, and energy. And if you're the low cost energy place in the world, you're a place where we make that. A lot of other industries fall into the same category, uh, and uh, uh, we are naturally the home of that. So I'm... Um, uh, towards the end of the book, I ask, I, I talk about uh, the, these transformational opportunities, and I say, uh, uh, how big, uh, where, and when? Well, how big, immense. Uh, turning uh, one quarter of our iron ore uh, 
uh, into iron metal uh, through uh, using renewable energy to make hydrogen and to use hydrogen rather than coke to reduce iron oxide into iron metal uh, and using one half of the aluminium oxide that we export, uh, turning that into aluminium metal. And all you need for that, same processes, same, uh, same facilities, uh, just renewable energy instead of coal-based energy. Just doing those two things would give you more jobs, more value, more exports uh, than all of our coal and gas combined. All of the other things, all of the other opportunities are on top of that. Um, where will it happen? Well, interestingly, uh, overwhelmingly in rural and provincial Australia, sorry Sally, uh, but, but, Melbourne, but Melbourne can be uh, the, the home of the brains that make it all work, and should be, and is at the moment actually, uh, and, uh, and supplying the, uh, uh, the, 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 the business, um, uh, leadership, uh, all of the services uh, required for this transformation uh, of Australia. Uh, and, uh, uh, and at first, the biggest opportunities will be in the old, cent old industrial centres of uh, coal generation based on coal mining. They are the centres of tr electricity transmission network that have taken coal power out uh, to the rest of the states in which they're in. From the Latrobe Valley, you've got the big high voltage lines down to Melbourne and out to Portland. Uh, in uh, Perth, in West Australia, you've got the coal mining area of Collie with lines out to Perth, uh, Kalgoorlie, Albany, uh, Geraldton. In, you've got the big uh, uh, coal generation in Newcastle with lines out to Sydney, a lot of industry in Newcastle itself. In Queensland, the biggest of the coal centres is Gladstone with with uh, lines going down to Brisbane. Uh, 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 in the Upper Spencer Gulf in South Australia, it's already happening. It used to be the coal centre. You've got the transmission from Port Augusta going out to, uh, uh, to Adelaide, to Wyala. Uh, well, these centres are naturally the centres of uh, uh, energy-using industries, using the transmission systems at first to bring in re low-cost renewable energy from other places. It's already working in South Australia. It can work like that uh, for the Latrobe Valley, for Newcastle, for the Upper, for uh, Collie in West Australia, for Gladstone in Queensland. A lot of these places felt threatened uh, by the loss of the coal industry and loss of jobs. Um, but there's a uh, look, uh, not very far ahead at all, uh, and uh, these become the first places in which uh, this new industry manifests itself. Um, uh, uh, and when will it happen? Well, I use the phrase several times in the book, it will happen gradually, and then it will happen suddenly. Some of these things are ready to happen now. Uh, zero emissions, aluminium is ready now. Uh, we will lose the aluminium smelters uh, in Portland, in Newcastle, in uh, Gladstone, the coal-based powers, very soon, so, some within a few years, all within a decade, if we stay with the current coal-based systems. They're just not economic anymore, and Rio Tinto and Alcoa, the companies that own them, are committed to zero emissions uh, aluminium production anyway. Uh, uh, we can give all of those uh, industries a new life, uh, by uh, making good use of the, uh, the, the, the uh, uh, low carbon opportunity of renewable energy. And that can happen right now. Uh, and, they not, and as soon as we start doing that, not only will they, those industries survive, they'll expand, uh, become uh, ver very much larger. Uh, the hydrogen-based iron making, uh, it's got a couple more steps in it. There's some, some elements of that mixed with natural gas that can happen now economically in Western Australia. Take a bit longer in some others. I'm working with, with German companies, uh, Japanese companies, and looking at some very practical opportunities there. Uh, but, it will, but it will happen gradually at first, and then Australians uh, will become aware of the immensity of the opportunity, and then it will all happen at once. It will happen gradually, then suddenly. Thank you.
you so much for that, Professor Garno. Uh, we will open up to questions from the floor in just a moment, but I wanted to steal a couple of questions first. And my big question is, in laying out this kind of plan, what needs to happen to get us there in terms of the political willpower or can it be led by the private sector or is it in fact led by people power or all three? Best if all three <laughs> and, and we, we won't get governments to act without people power. Uh, uh, we've had complicated politics on this as I've mentioned in my introductory remarks, uh, but uh, I don't think there's any doubt where Australian public opinion is now on this issue. Uh, as Peter Doherty, a Nobel laureate in medicine at the University of Melbourne, pointed out in a wonderful lecture at the Festival of Ideas at Melbourne University a few years ago, uh, on any scientific issue that's inconvenient for human behaviour, uh, there'll be a solid 10% of people who will refuse to believe the science. Well, I think we're just about down to that 10% on this one, down to about the core denial element that's there for immunisation, that's there for uh, uh, the, 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 the link between sexual behaviour and AIDS, uh, that uh, uh, it's there on any scientific e issue. Peter Doherty said that. I think we're pretty well down to that on uh, uh, denial of climate. Uh, the waters are muddied by extraordinary misinformation in, in the majority of the Australian print media. Uh, and uh, uh, it, it's muddied by huge investment by uh, uh, some of uh, the, corporate, the corporate sector with vested interests in the old economy uh, having an interest in misinformation. Uh, but uh, the, the, the polling of opinion shows pretty clearly that uh, where majority community opinion lies in Australia. So we've got a basis for community action that will make it very difficult uh, for governments uh, to stay outside uh, uh, effective policy. And I mention in the book, I say in the book, that, that the, it would be a very big mistake for the current federal government to read the outcome of the last election uh, as support for doing nothing on, on climate change. The business sector can do some things right now I think the, the aluminium-related things can be done right now uh, with a bit of innovation. Uh, the, uh, but uh, a few st steps in policy could make that much easier, it would accelerate it. And, and I've focused on steps that are not inconsistent with the policies that were taken to the election by the current federal government. Uh, I, uh, I've very deliberately done that. Uh, uh, so there's no, none of my recommendations uh, get in the way of this government now doing it consistently with its electoral commitments. Uh, uh, a, a, a little bit technical, but one of the recommendations of the ACCC is very important on un underwriting uh, firm retail contracts. Uh, I make a suggestion for uh, 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 supporting private initiative in unregulated uh, transmission lines, uh, some regulatory innovation uh, would be helpful there. Uh, I make a suggestion uh, for uh, development of the role of the of Snowy Hydro in providing reliability guarantees uh, for the, the Australian electricity system. None of these are inconsistent with current electoral commitments of the present government. Electoral commitments can be quite different, though, to what happens internally, particularly within the coalition, but within Labor as well. And you talk about the 10%, but that 10% within the parties can be very noisy. And I wonder what gives you the optimism that they will... Is it, is it the financial benefit, the economic benefit of a plan like this? Or, or what is it that... Have you met with anyone that gives you that optimism? Oh, don't call me optimistic. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I'm just saying Australians could be rich and deal with climate change <laughs> if they take the opportunity. But I don't presume that our leaders will take that opportunity. <laughs> it's a pretty tempting thing to uh, take, though. Have you had any interest from any of the current crop of politicians on either side? I was on Q&A two nights ago, and uh, we had the opposition spokesman on climate. We had a... Uh, 
uh, a member of the Parliamentary Liberal Party from uh, Sydney, uh, and they're both on board on zero emissions by the middle of the century, uh, and on board the superpower theme. So uh, <laughs> that's a small sample, but uh, so far so good. I wonder, um, just to venture slightly off that, I wonder, in coming up with these big policy ideas, as you've done pretty much your entire working life, is there a reason you prefer to do it from outside of the bubble rather than as an elected official? Why is that? Uh, I don't think I'd be much good at that job. <laughs> uh, I've worked very closely with the masters. I work very closely with Hawke on everything he did and I couldn't do that. Why? Uh, one thing I think uh, about both sides of issues. Uh, I'll give you one example. When John Howard made that speech in the 80s, uh, really appealing to what became the Hansonite vote, raising questions about Asian immigration. I was in the office with Bob and he heard that. It was on, he used to always have the, uh, what was going on in the parliament on the speaker, into the office on the speaker yeah. in his office <laughs> while he was having normal meetings. He heard that and he walked out straight into the parliament and, and gave a very powerful response for that, saying uh, Australia has to remain committed to non-discriminatory uh, uh, immigration, that it's the, it undermines our future as a country in this region if we start discriminating in immigration on the basis of race. That changed the debate. Uh, uh, that, that terrified uh, me and others in the office uh, because we hadn't carefully worked it all through. Uh, he did it when he heard those words. Uh, I would have taken a few days thinking about it and the moment would have been lost. <laughs> so, when you're working on a big project like this then, what, how, would your, how would your family members, your wife's here to keep you honest on this, how would they describe you? What's your, what's your work style? Oh, well, you better ask Jane that. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, obsessive might be a good word. Okay. Are there enough big policy ideas like yours, like, like we're seeing in Australia at the moment? Are we seeing enough of this kind of public debate of policy? Well, well there's enough in superpower to do. Uh, <laughs> we, uh, uh, no, this is not a great time for public policy in Australia. It's not a good time for ideas at all. It's not a good time for knowledge. Uh, I th our democracy is under threat. Uh, and the biggest threat is the downgrading of knowledge. Uh, it, 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 uh, we're, we're, we're seeing it in the most pointedly in the United States and in Britain but it's seeping in here. Uh, the, the, there was once a time, I think, in Australia, and I do look back on those hawk years as, as, as really the high point of, of good operations of our democracy, but uh, uh, where, where knowledge was the foundation of it all. And I talk about this in the early pages of the book. Uh, uh, but uh, today, uh, uh, knowledge is often thought to be relatively unimportant a falsehood is as good as a truth, uh, and uh, nothing works in a democracy uh, within this framework. Uh, we, we will not get back to sound policy. We will not deal with any of the huge problems our, uh, the world has, and the democracies in particular uh, have, unless we out raise the status of knowledge. Uh, to something as being of foundational importance uh, in our government. I guess given that climate and certainly the personal cost to many people after the climate wars in Canberra, to prime ministers, to leaders of both parties, it must have had a personal cost to you as well. How do you keep coming back from that? Uh, well, the, certainly during my second uh, climate change review, when uh, w when the opposition was contesting everything, it was actually quite pleasant during the first review when when everyone was agreeing with me. But uh, in, in <laughs> normally the, is <laughs> in the second review, uh, 
uh, there was bitter opposition. And I was naive enough not to even know what Astro's turfing was until it started happening to me, until the chief executive of BHP uh, said, uh, Ross, I want you to... I want you to know, I want you to personally know that we, that our company refused to be part of the astroturfing. And I said, what's that? And he said, oh, the, the, all the money that's being spent uh, organising the email campaigns uh, against you. And I, d I had thought it was a little bit strange that whenever I spoke, and I had lots of public meetings, including in the Melbourne Town Hall, within minutes of speaking, there'd be tens of thousands of emails uh, criticising me often personally abusive, some, sometimes vi threatening violence, me and my staff, uh, uh, and then copied to every politician in Australia, every journalist in Australia. The idea was to give the impression that there was a huge grassroots opposition to what I was saying. Uh, it worked with some people. Uh, you might remember Alan Jones during this time stood on the back of a truck in, uh, in front of Parliament House, Cambrick. He had said on radio there's going to be hundreds of thousands of people uh, at, uh, uh, at this demonstration. There were only a few dozen there. And some innocent uh, female journalist said, well, where are the hundreds of thousands of people? And he, in all innocence, said they must have been stopped at the ACT border by the police. Uh, because he had actually believed the astroturfing. <laughs> If only they uh, had the same roadblocks at the Canberra airport sometimes for the pollies flying in, I think, would have a better system. We might open the floor up to some questions now. We've got a question right at the front here, straight off the bat. Just give us two seconds while we um, come down to you with a microphone. And if you could introduce yourself and where you're from, that'd be great. Thanks. Uh, Chris Hennessy from Swinburne University. Thank you very much, Professor, for that fascinating history. Um, I just wonder, given you're obviously experienced in dealing with uh, sceptics or even outright deniers with respect to climate change, have you found that there is one argument which is more compelling or convincing or effective in terms of changing people's minds uh, that a layman like me could articulate beyond simply rising temperatures? Uh, as Peter Doherty taught me, uh, that there's a proportion of the community that will be unaffected by knowledge. Uh, and no matter what you say, they've got a belief system that will provide an answer. Uh, the, uh, you, you, you could download uh, the, the, the scientific American into the brain of Andrew Bolt or Greg Sheridan and they, uh, and they, they, they would have an answer to everything. Um, uh, and. Uh, 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 the, uh, so we just have to accept there's a proportion of humanity that is immune to knowledge uh, and uh, will not change their mind uh, under any circumstances. Uh, 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 but uh, for the rest, uh, and that's most of us, um, th then just being able to uh, uh, to, to, to draw attention to things that are actually happening, uh, uh, to, the, to the way what is happening is actually confirming uh, what people who read the science 12 years ago said, and all I did was read the science and translate it into what, what I was reading. Now, that is pretty sound on the question of bushfires. I said the science is saying that uh, uh, that that uh, uh, circumstances that that uh, in which bushfires arise will happen more often and then much more often, uh, and the bad ones will be much more severe. Uh, well, that's actually happening now. Now there are a lot of people who are much more persuaded by things they actually see uh, than by reading or uh, or, or li listening to, to to experts, and so. Uh, uh, t talking in a um, uh, in an unexcited way about what the scientific reality has always been saying, and then drawing attention uh, to uh, things that people can see, I, I think for most people is is most important. And for the for the big one, for Australia's transformational opportunities, Australia is the superpower in the. Uh, uh, zero carbon world, uh, that, that will be persuasive to most people when it starts to happen. Uh, 
uh, when we have our first zero emission steel mills and uh, aluminium smelters. Perhaps you can buy them a copy of the book right out the front there for $30. <laughs> Professor Johan Lindberg. Thank you. Um, Johan Lindberg, Monash University. Thank you for your talk and for your work. I've followed it for many years now. And um, uh, it's an interesting observation to make that it's two economists, you and your counterpart in the UK, Nicola Stern, who've actually had some of the most um, cut through on this. My question is, Nicola Stern was a few years before you with this report and, and you kept on... Um, uh, uh, kept on doing the work here for us, but his report was embraced in the UK. It was pretty much across the political spectrum. They have gotten on with action on climate change. Even in their completely dysfunctional current state, they still managed to get on with it. And this is a complete enigma to many people. So in your take, why are they getting on with it and not us? Well, Nick's a good mate of mine. And uh, all I can say is, He's much better at persuasion than I am. <laughs> uh, no, but uh, the spectrum of opinion is in a different place in two countries than in other countries. It's in a different place in the US and Australia than it is in Europe, including the UK or Japan or China or India. There's no serious opinion that denies... Serious opinion. There's still 10% of people who deny everything. But uh, there's no serious opinion in the UK... In, in continental Europe, in Japan, in China, in India, that denies climate change. There is in Australia uh, and, uh, uh, and the US. But that's partly uh, media culture. Uh, there was a study at Oxford University of why the spectrum of opinion on a couple of countries is different. I placed prime emphasis on, uh, on Fox News in the US and the majority uh, ownership uh, of, of a particular ideological, uh, someone with a particular ideological view in Australia. That's part of the story. Uh, um, and uh, uh, I think that uh, Australia and the US, the, uh, uh, the, the companies that produce fossil fuels for various reasons are particularly important politically. Uh, the coal industry was once politically important in the, in the UK, but uh, Margaret Thatcher destroyed it. Uh, she destroyed it not for climate change reasons, because, because she wanted to destroy the miners' union. And uh, she succeeded. And Britain had the very great advantage that uh, at the time it was led by a scientist. Margaret Thatcher was a scientist. Uh, Germany had the hu has the huge advantage that a first-rate physicist, Angela Merkel, is, is the head of government. She was a professor of physics. Uh, so that helps, uh, but the UK is different because they don't have a, a, a coal industry, they don't have uh, much of a gas industry, that no one sees the oil industry as a long-term uh, industry, but the difference in media culture uh, is, is important, and uh, uh, Nick must be much more persuasive than me. <laughs> yes, question there. Um, my name's Dominique Lafontaine. I run the South East Council's Climate Change Alliance. Uh, it's eight councils to the south east of Melbourne addressing climate change issues. I know that the Paris Agreement talks about the critical role of subnational governments in addressing climate change, and I'm sure you appreciate that local government is actually on the front line of addressing climate change around the country. So I'm, I'm just interested in, in your insight into what are the, the action that local governments can be taking uh, to, to raise the issue um, on, on the, the federal stage, but also to help protect the communities that, that they're there to look after? Yeah, obviously the two stages, the two, two elements of the role. One is in mitigation, in reducing carbon emissions, and the other is in adapting to the inevitable effects of climate change. Just on the latter to, to start with, uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, we're go we are in the process of being very seriously damaged by climate change. Um, uh, uh, there's a certain inevitability about that, there's a certain inevitability about it getting worse. Average temperature increases across the globe as a whole, globe as a whole already one degree. If we hold it to 1.5, that's significantly worse than we are now. Uh, now Average temperatures over land are greater, uh, uh, will, will increase more than over the Earth as a whole because the oceans will be slower. So 
one degree on the world as a whole is more than one degree over the Australian land mass. Uh, one degree is enough to, uh, to, to mean the combination of intensification of uh, storm events and rising sea levels is a threat to uh, uh, structures uh, in many uh, beach areas, already damaging parts of uh, Victoria, coastal Victoria. Sadly, some of the most beautiful uh, uh, places. Um, uh, and then temperature increases is, uh, 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 are a uh, threat to human health in various ways, uh, summer heat waves, uh, uh, and uh, uh, local governments traditionally have a role in welfare associated with, uh, uh, with the well-being of, of old people, vulnerable people in the community. Uh, so uh, that's a big role. It is especially, I say in my first report 11 years ago, that that's especially a role for local government. Adaptation is especially local, uh, and that's a big role for local government. On, um, uh, on mitigation, there's lots of roles for uh, uh, local government, but uh, one that I emphasise in the book is the role in the transport transition. Uh, the path to zero emissions trans uh, transport is through electrification and then decarbonisation of electricity, of, uh, electrification of rail, uh, of, um, uh, of trucks and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, buses and cars. Uh, electrification through batteries over short distances for air, but for long distances it will be more concentrated intense energy, it will be biofuels for, uh, for the foreseeable future. But the, the, the really big one uh, is uh, electrification of transport, um, whether it's directly through batteries or indirectly through hydrogen cars and then from hydrogen into an electric motor. Uh, they're both an electric process, they both depend on electricity. Uh, if, if it's zero emissions electricity, then the electric car or the hydrogen car is a zero emissions car. Uh, I, I, uh, I've got a chapter on transport uh, 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 from, from about 2022, the capital cost of an electric car will probably be similar to an internal combustion car. The running cost will be lower, the fuel cost will be lower, the car will be much more robust because the electric motor is a simpler motor, 80 moving parts compared with a thousand, so it'll last much longer. Uh, so one. So the economics from about 2022 will be powerfully in favour of the electric car. Other countries are moving more quickly on this. Uh, China now has about 6% of new cars electric. We've got about 0.2. Uh, uh, China has a green uh, number plate for electric cars. If you go from uh, Shanghai Hotel to Shanghai Airport, as I did two weeks ago, every third car now, it's not, a, not a, an average sample of the population going to the airport, but every third air car going to the airport is, uh, has got a green number plate. Uh, uh, we're a long way behind, uh, but, we, but we will catch up quickly because the economics will be uh, so strongly in favour of it. But we won't be able to catch up without uh, efficient uh, charging systems. And this is, a, this is going to require uh, cooperation amongst all levels of government, but especially it's a role for local government. Uh, and as I point out in the book, whether electrification of cars and transport leads to a big reduction in energy costs for other users or a big increase depends on how we do that. Uh, if, uh, uh, if we just keep the system exactly as it is now, the power price the same at seven o'clock in the evening as at 12 o'clock, people will come home They'll plug in their electric car when they get home. Uh, that will add to peak demand, put huge pressure on the network, huge pressure on the generation system at a time when, uh, uh, when power prices are highest. It will increase the cost of power to everyone else. Uh, uh, but if you have a charging system that makes power free in the middle of the day, in the middle of the night, and quite expensive uh, for charging an electric car, at peak hours, either peak for use of the network or peak for generation, uh, then uh, uh, it, it will greatly reduce the cost of the network and reduce the cost of power for everyone else. As I say in concluding that chapter, uh, there's a very big prize for getting that right, 
and that prize has to be won mainly by local government and I was talking to the Lord Mayor about that and uh, she said she's up to the challenge. <laughs> One last question from Kelvington Grammar up the back. Hi, uh, Lewis Weir from Kilmington Grammar School. I was just wondering what are your top three things that need to happen, not just in Australia, but globally, uh, to achieve a post-carbon world? Uh, are you ask, I'll ask you a question first. Are you, <laughs> you're asking me the three things if they were possible, or the three things that I think are most important amongst those that are, that are likely to happen soon. Um, three things that are possible to happen. Yeah. Uh, I, uh, I, I would like governments to uh, make available, the governments of rich countries to make available to developing countries, low-income countries, and I include China in the rich countries, uh, large amounts of capital at the cost of capital, uh, so that as they build their new energy and transport systems, they will build them renewably uh, without capital constraints. Uh, that's what, of course, the uh, UN Green Fund's about. It's what uh, uh, the Chinese uh, huge uh, expansion of uh, international investment and uh, uh, in infrastructure is about. I'd like us to join that. Uh, we don't have to join it through those existing institutions. We can have our own international fund and there's some ways of doing that. Uh, a, a variation on that theme to help the domestic uh, transformation is acceptance of recommendation four of the ACCC in its report on the electricity sector and so that I don't bore people too much, I just refer them to the electricity chapter uh, in the book. Uh, uh, Transport for Australia is 18% of emissions, uh, a bit less than that for the world as a whole, uh, but uh, 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 all, all levels of government, and especially local government, putting a lot of effort in the next couple of years in get, into getting the charging framework right for electric vehicles can make a very big contribution. Uh, and uh, you asked for three, I'll give you a fourth. Uh, putting a huge effort uh, scientific research technology, including into development of low-cost uh, means of measuring carbon uh, to facilitate uh, uh, a tr trade in uh, carbon credits derived from carbon in soils, pastures, woodlands, forests and plantations. There you go, the bonus answer. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Professor Ross Garno. Uh, copies of Superpower are available for sale at the front as you leave. Thank you for being so generous in answering all of our questions. Uh, and thank you again to our sponsors who make events like this possible. We really do appreciate it. And a small token of our appreciation. And thank you, Ash. Thanks for the press club and uh, good to be with you. Lovely. We'll see you all. See you all in early 2020 for our next Press Club lunch. Thank you, everyone. See you.